So thanks for uh, thanks for joining me tonight. If you have a question, I'll, I'll unmute a couple of times throughout the presentation so that you can uh, throw out a question or you can send it via the chat. Unfortunately, a lot of times I don't see the, um, the chat thing as I'm going. You know? So um, if I um, if I don't see it, you can shout it out uh, later on. And hopefully I have everybody. Oh, Steve, one of yours is uh, one of yours is off. I'm just going to mute you here. At least I think I muted you. you. Got some feedback. Mm -hmm. or something. But um, that's not allowing me to mute everybody here. Maybe I just did. Um, all right. Well, thanks for joining me tonight. Uh, obviously, last year was a very good year for us. And um, where we made a terrific return of uh, you know about fifteen percent for our balanced portfolios, and uh, I'm not sure somebody's unmuted here. Don't know. Oh, I see who they are. <laughs> and for some reason, it won't let me mute them, but I don't want to dismiss them. So hopefully, they'll mute themselves here. Somebody's cooking in the background. It smells good. Whoever's cooking. Um. If, if you have a question though, while you're um, while you're listening, just go ahead and and shout it out, and um, hopefully I'll, I'll I'll see it and get to it. Um, last year was a very good year for us. We uh, we had very nice returns, obviously, and it's always good in the good years to to make money. And um, unfortunately, when the market goes down, a lot of people get I'm very sorry, nervous. I'm going to put you on. This. I'm going to put it on. This. I yeah, I thank you. Whoever. No, no, no. Go ahead. I was thinking that was smart enough. I can't see who's on. Maybe they dialed in. Somebody dialed in and is on. Uh, is not on here, so I can't unmute you. Hopefully, we'll get. Hopefully, whoever dialed in here can mute themselves. Um, but anyway, thank you very much for uh, for joining. Um, last year was a very good year, and of course, the um, the this year is, has been a bad year for the stock market. The good news for us is that we're actually up a little bit. So I know if you look at your portfolio daily, like some some of you do, you'll you would actually have noticed that our stocks, our U.S. stocks, are up a little bit. Our international stocks are up about two percent. Our bonds are down about a percent. And so overall, because we only have about twenty percent or so in uh, in bonds. Uh, we're uh, we're up a little bit on the year, which is which is nice. Um, so sometimes it's in protecting your portfolio is more important than actually making the money, especially when you have a lot of bloodshed. Code by the pound or hash sign. <laughs> I apologize for. Uh, I think somebody called in now. Okay, get them muted. Let's see. Oh, I think I got it. I got the, I got the culprit. I got one here. Um, so uh, I think that it's important to kind of know that for, for the great majority of you too, our strategy is always to get you current income so that regardless of the ups and downs of the market, we've had plenty, we've gone through plenty. For a lot of you, we've, we've been through um, uh, a great deal over the past two decades. We actually have our 25th anniversary as a company coming up uh, next month, uh, which is incredible to think about. That's why I have all this gray hair in my beard here. Um, it's been a, uh, a very wild ride for, uh, for a couple of decades, but for all of us, we've done very well because we haven't panicked and we just kept collecting our, our dividends, you know, and that's figurative, figuratively and literally, um, they've always paid us and allowed us to continue uh, to enjoy, to get paid and, and, and live through the, um, the brutal periods of time when the market was selling off significantly. And, and our portfolios, of course, sold off also. Um, but Pepsi kept paying their dividend, Procter & Gamble kept paying their dividend. And that's always been the key for us is to, uh, to weather the storms. So I don't know if a storm is around the corner. Um, it could be, you, you never really know when the next recession is coming. We'll talk about what could, what could cause that uh, and our strategy to go through it. But regardless, the companies we own will continue to pay you. Um, and that's that's been our our strategy over the last uh, two decades. One of the problems when you turn on the television, a lot of times you'll hear, "Oh, the stock market is down." And um, a strategy that a lot of institutions that we sell to also 
you know, whether we're selling to the New Jersey Fire and Police or whether we're selling to the Chicago Teachers Union or we're selling to some financial advisor in, in California, um, a lot of them index. They just take their clients' money or they take their institution's money and they throw it in the S&P 500. And that's okay in certain periods of time. Uh, it's not a bad way to invest, uh, but it can become problematic at other periods of time when it gets to be that it's dominated by a particular sector or a particular group of stocks. And I call these the, the fat man stocks here. This, you know, the Facebook, which is now Meta, Amazon, Tesla, uh, Microsoft, Apple, um, Alphabet, which is Google, and Netflix. Uh, and if you look at these stocks as a whole, they now make up more as a market capitalization than all of the companies we own combined. Exxon, Chevron, Dow Chemical, uh, Haynes Brand, McDonald's, Pepsi, Coke, all of these companies that, that you and I own, because I own the same companies that, that you do. When we sell something like, um, like, we, like we sold yesterday, we sold Qualcomm. Qualcomm was a great company. As a value investor, we're usually in early and we're out early. And um, I think that um, if you think about uh, Qualcomm, um, it was going through a lot of trouble with, uh, with Apple and um, it was a really nice fat dividend and was selling at a very reasonable valuation. And now it's, it's, it's gone up 125% since we bought it years ago. Uh, and, and believed it was time to sell it. And we bought Viacom, which some of you have, you know, you get Paramount. So you have Paramount TV, CBS, um, 1883 and Yellowstone for those of you who like uh, uh, those, those programs. Um, and we think that that's a better position for our clients to be in because it's not selling at the just insane valuations that these companies have. Now we, we did own Apple and we own Microsoft. For years I owned Microsoft and it really did nothing. Um, and then it just took off like a rocket ship. Uh, and we sold it a few years ago. And Apple, we sold last year after, you know, it just did terrifically well for us. And so from that from that point in time, uh, the valuation is so rich and the dividend is so small for you, where we're getting a half a percent that it doesn't make sense for us to continue to hold it. So we sold Apple and we bought Gilead Sciences, where we think healthcare companies are offering you a 4% dividend yield and selling an attractive valuation. And I think it's important not to always do what everybody else is doing. Um, you know, the aardvark is a unique animal. And uh, just like the aardvark, we invest in a unique way. And we don't ever follow the herd. We kind of go out alone and unafraid at night. Um, because we don't want to be invested right now 25% of the S&P 500, which is down year to date about 9%, I believe, uh, as of today. Um, it was 8.5% yesterday. It was down some more today. Um, is really dominated by just these few companies. NASDAQ is over 50% of just these companies. So to me, it doesn't make sense for us to own any of these stuff. As much, you know, Tesla was down 10%. I have high regard for Elon Musk and what he does. And I think the Tesla is a nice car, but that doesn't mean I have to pay 300 times earnings for the company. That would be like somebody offering me $300 million today for my company. Now, I've asked my son, if, I, if somebody offered me $300 million, would, it, would I sell my company? He said, no, dad. I said, because he's heard me say a million times, I won't sell the company. But if somebody offered me $300 million, I'd be crazy not to. And the problem with, the, the problem with owning you know, some of these companies that have just extreme valuations and have market capitalizations greater than all of the auto companies combined, um, the, everything has to happen perfectly for them to continue to do well. I mean, we've seen what happened to companies like Peloton um, and others which, which uh, have blown up. And we're just never gonna chase a fad, whether it's a company like Peloton or, or Tesla or even Amazon. Again, I have tremendous regard for Jeff Bezos, but we're not gonna uh, buy a company, and I talk about it in my book, that, that you know, it, where everybody is chasing momentum and, and chasing the herd and, and following just because it keeps going up and up and up. You know, for us, you want to pay a reasonable price. It's kind of like if you ever watch, um, what's that company, the, the Shark Tank or where Mr. Wonderful's on it. And, um, and they, they're always buying a company and they're getting a pitch. And he says, what are your earnings? And, he's, and he says, that valuation is crazy. Well, it's no different if you're buying a small company that makes cookies where you're, well, let's say that company makes a million dollars a year. You might pay, you might pay $5 million for that company. You know, you might pay five times earnings for it. But 
Mr. Wonderful or Mark Cuban or any of the other people on Shark Tank are not going to pay $100 million for that cookie company because that valuation would be crazy, even though they're on television, even though it might be the greatest cookie to ever been made. And for us, that's part of our discipline is we're not going to chase performance. And you, you many of you remember, because you're as old as me, if not a little bit older, that IBM was the largest company in the world back in 1980. And today, of course, it's not. AT&T, if you can believe it, was the second largest. And you see a lot of energy companies here at the top. And General Electric was in the top 10. Uh, all of these companies have fallen from the top 10. Um, and if you invested in the biggest companies in the world at that time, it, it wasn't a good strategy. The same thing in 1999. Many of you remember America Online or Lucent Technologies. Uh, and some of these companies have just gone by the wayside. Uh, of course, today you'll see in, in, in 2020, it's now Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, the companies I was talking about here that make up such a huge portion. But if you invest in the largest company each year, going back to the 1970s, it was a very poor strategy. You usually do not want to invest in the biggest company. So from our standpoint, what we do is an economic scenario analysis is we look at the worst case scenario. So these are the doomsayers, like a Dr. Rabini, or when you get on television and you hear people say, the sky's falling, this is the end times, Trump is president, Biden is president. Um, that, that We're modeling for a horrific case scenario, higher inflation, uh, stagflation. And under this scenario, stocks do very, very poorly. And it's possible that this could happen. And we have to kind of steal ourselves that we may be only getting the dividends from our portfolio, especially when you look at it, I, I'm looking at the broader markets, not our individual stocks. Our companies are selling at about 15 times forward earnings right now, which is about the 100 year average for stocks. So the companies you and I own, they're very reasonably priced. So when you hear the market's overvalued, I would agree with that. But that's again, is because of those very high multiple uh, stocks. Now, the market could go down 25% at any time for any reason. It could be, um, Kevin, I see your, um, I see your question in here about um, Ukraine. So that, that could be a, uh, a geopolitical risk, you know, on, on how it might, if, if Russia invaded the Ukraine. We're probably still going to drink Pepsi. We're probably still going to use Tide detergent and, and, and use Procter and Gamble products. So probably, you know, just like when they went into an annex Crimea, it's probably not going to have much of an impact longer term. Uh, on the market if um, if if uh, we have Russia invading Ukraine. Now, if we got into a war with Russia, obviously that would have a, a short-term impact on the, uh, uh, on the market. Um, the base case scenario is sort of what we think will happen in most scenarios. And you can see US stocks probably won't outperform international stocks. Um, and bonds are a horrible investment, right? Acro almost across the board, even high yield bonds, which we own, we're only getting you about a four, four and a half percent yield. And you can see this for the bonds that we're buying for you. This is why I would rather own a company like a real stable one, like a Procter and Gamble or a Kraft, rather than, or a Hanes brand underwear. This morning I was wearing my Navy sweatshirt made by Champion, which is right there in North Carolina, um, you know, owns by, is owned by, uh, by Hanes. And I'd rather own a stable company that I think is going to be around rather than some of the high yield bond companies that we own, you know, like, you know could be a Goodyear Tire or, uh, or Macy's, which we uh, just bought. And you could have more, you know, you're occasionally going to have bankruptcies in the high yield sector. So we're starting from a very low yield, even in the high yield market, which is why this is just about 20% of our portfolio right now. Now, in a perfect world, if we have a Goldilocks scenario, these are the people, you know, where you'll hear economists where they always think everything's going to be perfect. And there aren't too many of these people, but stocks could keep going and could rip and could continue to rip. Um, I don't think this is very likely. I put the bear case scenario, maybe a 10% um, possibility. I don't think it's probable. I put the bull case scenario at about a 5%. I, I think this is you know just too optimistic. So this is the base case. So I think we have to all be ready for the fact that we've done terrifically well over the last decade. Um, but maybe we're going to have less returns. Maybe we're going to have five to seven percent uh, type returns and not get the returns that we've we've had um, over the last decade. Um, so we kind of have to be ready for that. From our own spending standpoint, you know, keeping to your dividends is probably a good strategy for you personally when you're working with Chris uh, and Rob and Greg. Um, you know, I think it's important that you kind of think from 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 that perspective. Um, 
from the, I think that, um, uh, hey, Sharon, about the empty shelves. Yeah, I'll, I, you know, the inflation is going to be an issue. So the empty shelves is a supply, is a supply issue. And, and it kind of goes to this, where I think that if you look at um, COVID, it's really, it's been very similar to the Spanish flu. And that it was a two year cycle for the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu is killing young people. Whereas, of course, COVID is killing uh, older people. Um, and um, I think that we're getting close. The good news about Omicron is that it's extremely uh, more contagious, it, it, 10 times, 100 times more contagious. Everybody's getting it, right? It's been through our family twice now, COVID. And um, I may have to put you on speaker here because I might lose my... Uh... Can you hear me okay still? Somebody shake their head if they can still hear me. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, so I think that, I think that, and I, I never thought we would recover this quickly. So this, this has been my thesis. We went from 50% stock to 80% stock over the last two years. And it was because I thought stocks were so cheap during COVID that it gave us a great opportunity to buy some companies that I haven't been able to buy for years. And some we've already subsequently sold like Starbucks, which, you know, we went up so much that we felt it was a good time to, to sell it. Um, so I think that the economic recovery is going to go with, the, the virus recovery. And I think we're close, whether it's, you know, out here in Montana, nobody's wearing masks, the kids aren't wearing masks at school. Uh, it's spreading about the same as in New Jersey. When I go back and forth every two weeks between New Jersey and Montana, um, you know, everybody's masked up. I had dinner with my daughter, Hannah, in, in, uh, in New York City. And I think that that's what's interesting is it's, it's spreading everywhere, even when people are extremely safe and, and, and are highly vaccinated, whereas out here in Montana, no, the, the vaccination rate is very, very low. And you can kind of see that, um, that everybody everywhere, whether it's New Jersey or Montana, is sort of over it, right? They're over, um, they're over and getting back to their lives. And uh, the good news is, is the death rate is up. It's up to about where Delta, uh, Delta is, but it, it, hopefully now it's starting to, to peak. And I think that that should help the supply situation. Um, and that this economic recovery will, will continue as long as we don't have some more virulent, more deadly uh, variant come out, which is possible, but not probable in the, in, in the way that viruses usually work. So the other problem is, and the bigger problem in my opinion is inflation. So you may have heard yesterday, um, uh, Fed Chair and Powell talk about how um, inflation it really came out out of the gate. We had uh, one of Maximus's friend, my my son, my oldest son's friend, who works for the Chicago Fed, was here for two years or two weeks over Christmas, and um, I was teasing him that you know I said tell Charlie who's the the Chicago Charlie Evans, the Chicago Fed uh, uh, chair. I said tell Charlie to you know start talking about you guys are behind the curve. You need to raise rates, and you're missing it. And Powell basically once he was going to be reconfirmed, kind of came out and started talking about it. And yesterday he said, frankly, you know what, inflation's worse than I expected. And he's gotten rid of the transitory talk and we're, we're seeing that. You kind of see that on this chart here that inflation is here. And he said that inflation's here until the end of the year, at least. And I think that's the case. We're not, we're not gonna go backwards. And I thought it might be transitory. And if you read my newsletters, I was saying it could be, but I said, once it shows up in wages, then that's it. Then the party's over. Um, so once, uh, you see this occurring where you have to pay people more. Augustus, my son, was making almost $30 an hour as a busboy last summer here in Montana, um, you know, because they just couldn't get people to to work. So that, that you know, that forces everybody uh, to uh, have to pay more for those goods. And and to get people, we've had this great resignation of people who are, are looking for different types of jobs that's occurring. And that's likely to continue to occur as people find places to live and, and work that they want to and at wages that they that they want also. So I think that um, now that it's into wages, we're going to see it stay for quite a while. And um, what you'll notice, too, is that the expectations are starting to raise also. We're starting to see expectations for inflation are here. Everybody realizes they're here. And the Fed, with their dot plot, is realizing, hey, we're behind the curve. I was teasing them. He said, hey, how are we at the, at the Fed doing in terms of communicating with you asset managers? And I said, it doesn't matter what you communicate to me because your dot plots are always wrong anyway. You know, I said, you guys could tell me what you're going to do on the day you're going to do it. And it doesn't matter because you don't know either. You know, and, and clearly Powell didn't know. 
Um, and uh, he's looking at the tea leaves on a daily basis and deciding what they're going to do. And they need to raise rates quickly. And they're going to raise at least a quarter point in March. You know, since Greenspan, for 20, 30 years, we've been doing this quarter point, quarter point, quarter point. It's not like the Fed used to be where they just come in like Paul Volcker did back in 1980, 81, and raised it 3%. And we had, of course, uh, very high inflation of, of 16%, 18% mortgage rates, and um, which some of you will, will remember. And the Fed would, would move much more quickly. They try to do things more slowly because a, a change today doesn't really start hitting the economy until a year from now. So they can talk the inflation game down to try to uh, dampen expectations for inflation. Um, but they may have to, they may be forced not to be able to do this quarter point, quarter point, quarter point. So what does that mean um, for us in terms of, you know, the, the rest of the world is starting to raise rates too, with, with some exceptions like Japan and the ECB in Europe. Um, but what it means generally is it's bad for everything. Inflation is bad for everything. It's horrible for cash because your money is going backwards, right? If, if you have 6% inflation and you're making a 0% rate of return, you're losing 6% a year when your money's in cash. It's terrible for bonds because bonds are a fixed interest rate. And when you only, even in high yield bonds where you're only getting a four or 5% return, if you have 6% inflation, you're going backwards. And it's usually sometimes okay for stocks, especially certain types of stocks. So we're trying to protect your portfolio now with energy companies, consumer staples, and others that will be more sensitive uh, where they could pass it on. So Procter & Gamble is passing on higher costs to you and I for their goods. Um, but you'll notice here with the slide that I um, put in here from Ned Davis is that you'll kind of see in, in the green shows that when the Fed's not raising rates, stock do fabulously. And when they do it slowly, when they raise rates slowly, especially in the first year, stocks do just fine. And even in the second year, they do just fine. However, when they do this fast tightening cycle, you see the yellow line here, stocks do nothing. They actually go down a little bit over two years. And in the intermediate term here, in the short term, in these first few months, they could drop pretty significantly, 10, 15%. And we're seeing that in the S&P 500. Again, hasn't happened for us because we've, all the terrific gains we had last year, we're holding on to this year. That said, we could see our stocks, we could see the baby getting thrown out with the bathwater and those large companies like the S&P 500 also go down. Um, so kind of be prepared that with higher inflation and the Fed raising rates, if they raise them quickly, if you hear the Fed raising rates quickly, that could be bad for stocks where we have a 0% rate of return over two years. And um, we're not going to try to time this, though. There's no way we could know, like, oh, the Fed's going fast. We're going to move to cash, and then we're going to get back in. That's just a, a loser's game. It's a, it's, it's a, you know, a fool's errand of trying. Think about it. just the other day, the stock market, the Dow Jones was down like 800 points in the morning. And then it rallied all the way back and finished up like uh, 100 points or 200 points. Imagine trying to time it in the middle of the day. You know, it's just, it's crazy. And, and people think of the stock market often as like a casino, but it's not. It's investing in real companies that you're investing in long-term that the stock price eventually is going to follow earnings. And we're going to collect the dividend while we wait patiently for the stock price to go up. We're not going to, you know, try to get in and out of the market. Uh, and, and, and I just wanted to show this because I thought it was pretty insightful to what happens during um, Fed tightening cycles. Fiscal policy, you know, the BBB didn't pass, and um, that's probably a good thing for inflation, right? We, it, was, it was just too much money. We, already spent, we had a bipartisan bill that passed uh, for the infrastructure, and that's a lot of money that will eventually kind of work its way into the economy. Um, and um, the BBB probably would have been very inflationary. And that's one of the reasons why two Democrats voted uh, against it. And we may now it'll be better and that maybe some of the parts of it will come out uh, and get passed in parts, maybe a child uh, tax credit, maybe uh, some uh, environmental issues. Um, but it'll be on a one and it won't be this massive three trillion dollar type of bill. But that will be a bit of a it feel like a bit of a drag fiscally because the government's been just forcing so much money. The Fed, you got monetary policy where they're doing everything they're doing. Uh, printing money effectively, and then you've got on the on the fiscal side, politicians just spending money like crazy to kind of get us through COVID. And so they're still spending a lot of money, but it will feel like not as much because they're slowing the rate of their spend. 
the labor market is fabulous right now though we have this, see this problem this is the problem we have all these people who uh all these job openings you know there's 10 million or so job openings and there's only uh, this many people four million plus who are looking for work or unemployed so you have this gap so what how does this gap you know get filled well it gets filled one way you got to pay people more if you want them to come to work uh, for you and we pay people to stay at home for a long time so now they're kind of finally being forced back into the labor market so i suspect that this gap's going to be here for a while and that you're going to have um again wages are going to remain high for a while and that's going to be another uh force on inflation so unemployment's low and it's come but it has come back but it's still a little bit above pre-pandemic so we're not all the way back to to where we were but by historical standards it's at a very low rate. Now we have lost a lot of people who've just retired and said, you know what, I'm not going back to work. Um, so there are a lot of people who haven't come back to the workforce yet. And um, how we fill them is normally through immigration. And uh, obviously we have a, a couple of issues going on right now with immigration. Our debt has just gone through the moon. If you're interested in my theory on, on debt, um, and I put in here Democratic presidents so you can kind of see this is not a Democrat Republican thing. You'll remember nobody wants the Carter years back, although he's a Naval Academy grad like me. You know, we remember we only had 30 percent debt to GDP, but the economy was in bad shape. Reagan ramped up the debt huge, um, you know, during the 80s. And, and Bush continued that um, when we were fighting the Soviet Empire. And, and, uh, and 60 percent is probably not terrible. Um, and the Clinton years were good for the economy, and that allowed us to get the debt down a little bit. Uh, Bush, too, increased it back to where Clinton was. Obama exploded the debt uh, during the financial crisis. And then during COVID, Trump exploded it even more. But he's a real estate guy, right? So he doesn't mind debt. And the big question mark is, because capitalism is a you know 300-year endeavor, the big question mark is, is what's too much? Japan's had 200% debt to GDP for decades. And nobody seems to sneeze at that. Um, we had basically, you know, we, we, we had the chance, I think we should do, if we, if we can, if people will buy a 100-year treasury, U.S. treasury bond at 2% or 3%, we should do it, right? I mean, um, then, we're, then we're getting our debt monetized over 100 years, um, and that's not a bad idea if, if rates, which rates will eventually start to go higher again, and this is going to get even more expensive to finance. And then the question is, is what's too much? Many of the companies that we lend money to, let's say it's Goodyear Tire, I often liken them to a young doctor. Let's say the young doctor is making $400,000 uh, a year. And that young doctor has got a good salary. And if you're a bank, you're happy to lend him three times his salary or $1.2 million to buy a new home. And that's a 300% debt to income. So maybe the big question is maybe 300% debt, maybe nations should have more debt. The problem is, is we've had nations go bankrupt at 30%, much like uh, uh, Iceland uh, or even Ireland was strained. And we've had, you know, uh, obviously we have plenty of countries go bankrupt and can't pay their debt back because their taxing authority isn't uh, good enough um, at much higher levels of debt. I don't know what the problematic level is for American, you know, uh, as a patriot, you and I can worry about these issues and worry about them for our children. As a capitalist, as an investor, I don't care because I know that Procter & Gamble is going to find an outlet for their goods somewhere. And right now, America is in a good position in that the dollar is still the world re reserve currency. And we do have a great taxing authority. As much as you and I might leave states like high tax states like California and move to places like Colorado or Montana or move from New Jersey or New York or Connecticut uh, down to North Carolina or Florida, we're, most people are not going to leave the United States and, and you know, renounce their citizenship. They're still going to pay taxes here in the United States. So that's the good thing about the United States tax. At least the, the government, the federal government is going to get their money, whereas states are going to be in some trouble because they're losing people hand over fist, especially now that they realize, hey, I can work from anywhere. I don't have to work from New York City. And I don't have to, you know, we can relocate our people, kind of like our people, right? Where uh, Zach, our fixed income portfolio managers in Austin, uh, Anu, one of our analysts is in Connecticut. Um, we've got Greg, who's in New Jersey, but he's in Central Jersey. He's rarely in our our northern office, our northern New Jersey office. We have two associates in Raleigh. We have 
uh, two associates in, uh, in, in New Bern, but with three, because Rita works from her home primarily, and then Becky works uh, from the coast of North Carolina. She very rarely goes into the New Bern office. So, you know, we've got associates all over, just like we have uh, clients all over the country, and people realizing that, hey, we can reduce our, our footprint for our business, not to spend all this money on real estate. We don't have to be in one spot. And then we don't have to pay our people as much because they're working in Utah or they're in Salt Lake City or they're working in Austin or they're working in Denver, Colorado, rather than New York City, San Francisco or other high uh, expensive states or expensive cities. So that's kind of a fascinating thing that's happening with the economy right now. Um, but that bodes very well um, for, for consumers. So the, the American consumer is doing fabulously. Um, this is the only time in history where you'll notice that um, income, income actually went up during a recession. Going all the way back to 1960, during every recession, incomes went down. And when income goes down, your spending goes down. And that's all part of a recession. Well, this, in this case, we paid people to stay at home and their incomes went up. It's fascinating. Their spending, if you'll notice this little blip here, their spending did not go up because we were all sitting in our homes. We couldn't spend our money. And, but once we got out, once we started spending, you'll see that consumption went back up and the American consumer, his savings rate is back at a level, which is pretty sound, right? Where everybody was putting their money in their pocket, getting the PPP loans or getting free money from the government. They weren't going out there and spending it too much initially, but now they, now they are, but they're keeping their savings ratio at a pretty sound level. And for corporations, so they're, and they are spending some, right? They're going, they've gone out and bought new homes. Um, home sales have gone, real estate's gone crazy in, in a lot of places, and now it's finally recovering in the cities where it was the only area it wasn't. Um, so we're seeing home sales that, that, that are probably going to start topping out now, especially since interest rates will go higher. Auto sales, everybody was going out and buying new cars. We had car shortages and chip shortages, and people were paying ridiculous values for cars. Well, we really don't need one, right? I mean, I'm still driving a 2000 Land Cruiser with 280 something thousand miles on it that my son Augustus now uses primarily. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we got a nice little Subaru and an F-150 here in Montana, but we, you don't really need to go out and buy a new car or a new truck because they last a very long time. Um, but people still are going out and buying these things. So it's something that I like to look at from an economic standpoint. Um, and this is allowing for corporate profits to do exceptionally well. So we're seeing uh, corporate profits, as you can see here, at very high uh, rates, productivity is high, net margins are high, and they're passing along that, those higher cost of goods uh, to us, the consumers. So that's the economic outlook. Now, what does that mean for investments? Well, kind of like I was showing you that chart um, from an investment standpoint, uh, we had this situation where all these big stocks, you know, the, the, the fat man stocks, Apple's and Microsoft's of the world, driving the S&P higher. There's going to be a reckoning. I started talking about it in my book when I was, you know, was back in 2018. Um, I talked about how these stocks are getting too big. And I was, on, I was on Fox Business that morning, and I told the anchor, I said, the S these few stocks are at 17% of the S&P 500. She kind of took a step back. She said, 17%? She said, are you sure? I said, yeah. I said, I, I, I just looked this morning. And, it's, and now it's not 17% anymore. It's 25%. So these companies have gotten even larger. The last time, as you can see here, that we've had this type of outperformance of growth and momentum stocks was in 2000. And we all remember what happened, right? The NASDAQ lost 70% of its value. The S&P lost 35, 40% of its value. It was a true reckoning, a bloodletting of the larger tech companies. It was horrific. Now, back in 2000, for those of you who are clients back then, remember, we were down, the worst case scenario, I think we were down like 12% maybe. We, because I wasn't buying stupid stocks then, just like we're not buying stupid stocks now, or I like to call them clown stocks, right? These stocks where they come out and, you know, they have, maybe they even have lots of revenue. Some are pre-revenue. They don't even have revenue, like a Rivian or something, you know, like a car company. Some of them have revenue, but they don't have earnings yet. They're just bleeding all over the place. That would be like me saying, hey, my company lost $4 million this year. We're going to lose $5 million next year, but we're going to get some great big accounts. You know, the state of Illinois is going to be investing in us. We're going to explode. That's great, but, that, you know, it, it may not happen. And I, I, I'm not ever going to invest in hope with your life savings. We're investing in real companies with real earnings 
at reasonable valuations that pay you a dividend and pay us to wait. And, you know, for years here, I've been talking about this. And a lot of times, you know, you just I wouldn't short these companies because, as the old saying goes, you, the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent, you know, when you're short those companies. So I'm never going to short those companies or certainly not borrow money but we're not gonna invest in them, right? And, and we sold off the few that we own, the Apples and Microsofts that were reasonable back when we owned them and bought them back in here. And, you know, and, 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 and subsequently had terrific returns, but now it's time for us to move out of those high expensive stocks because we saw it last year where value started to outperform growth, but then Delta hit and everybody said, okay, let's go back to the, you know, go back to the COVID trade. And let's go buy Peloton again. And let's go buy the big tech stocks. Now, this year, we're starting to see that, again, that recovery of, um, of value stocks outperforming because, you know, we're flat this year. And again, the S&P is down, NASDAQ's down 11, 12 percent. It was down again today, another percent. And you're seeing every time there's a rally, you're seeing a sale into the rally. People are starting to get out. They're kind of heading for the doors. And what are they doing? They're rotating into quality companies like ours. Now, I don't care if somebody, you know, fires us because our U.S. stocks only made 22% last year and the S&P made, let's say, 25. I don't, you know, that, that's not what we're going to do. Our, our mantra is always to participate in the rising markets, perform in the sideways markets, and protect you by providing income in the down markets like we're doing right now. And that's always been our mantra because not losing money is often more important than making money, not going after that shiny object that entices you to invest in it, whether it's Bitcoin, which I don't know how to value that, or anything else that has a crazy valuation, we're not going to participate in. That's part of being disciplined as an investor. And uh, so you don't burn yourself and have this abject collapse, which is eventually going to come to these companies. Don't know when, but it'll come. Could be, this could be the beginning. The same is true for international. Now, this year, I've been saying for a couple of years now that I think international may outpace U.S. stocks. Didn't happen last year, but maybe this is the year. International is outperforming U.S. this year, and we've had this massive outperformance here of U.S. stocks over the green line of international stocks. So maybe this is due to change over this year and for the years to come. Again, P ratios are very, very high for the U.S. in comparison to international, so it looks pretty good to us. And I don't want to get into the dollar too much, but basically think of the dollar and the fact that if you if you are um, if the dollar is going uh, you know down or or up, it can help international stocks or it can hurt international stocks as as U.S. investors. So if we have the dollar that's declining in value. Uh, our foreign uh, our foreign companies like a Nestle chocolate company or a GlaxoSmithKline have to convert their uh, euros, which are let's say it's stronger, into cheaper U.S. dollars. That benefits us with our international companies, and vice versa. If the dollar is really strong, that doesn't benefit us with our international companies. So we may, if the dollar weakens some, we may get some headwinds for international stocks also. Treasury yields are very low. I had a client ask me this morning. He said, you know, hey, is there anything you could do for me for short term cash? And I said, no, you know, uh, cash is going to make zero and it's going to make zero for a while. We're starting to see the 10 year Treasury kind of creep up. It's up to 1.8, which is a major move from last year where it started at less than 1% for it to almost double. Um, and that's going to obliterate bonds, which is why we don't want to be buying bonds. Or if we buy them, we want to buy very short term bonds. So we may manage some cash for our clients and manage, uh, you know, short term treasuries uh, for you. But we're not going to make much money from from uh, from treasuries because we're at very, very low yields at, at the starting levels. Um, and that's the whole world. The whole world looks like that. I mean, if you look at, um, you know, look at a, a rate chart across the globe, like here's a um, let me just show you a chart here from uh, from the world. Some countries actually have negative rates. You have to you have to pay them to hold your money. Like uh, Switzerland, you'll notice here. Here's the uh, uh, the ten year bond of Switzerland is at um, uh, what's that negative point one five. Um, you'll you see the um, uh, the UK is at 1.2, we're at 1.8. Uh, Germany's at a negative yield. So you have to, if, if you give Germany your money, 
you have to pay them to hold your, your money for 10 years. You're going to get less back than you put a hundred thousand dollars in. You're going to get, you know, uh, 99,000 or something back. Um, uh, I, I bonds are a nice way, uh, uh, uh Marion Barber just, uh, mentioned I bonds. The only problem with I bonds is you're only limited to a very small amount that you can put in them. I think it's 20, $25,000 is the limit or so for I bonds. So you really have a limit and they do go with inflation. So if inflation is high, they give you some inflation protection. Um, treasuries are also, you know, tips are ways to protect against inflation. But the problem with tips is they have negative yields right now too, because they're going to, you know, pay you for the inflation. So I don't think tips are a good investment. Um, so I bonds might be okay for $20,000, $25,000 that you could put in, but it's not a sizable amount of money. Uh, and you can see the whole globe is in this position though. Um, you'll notice Japan's at 0.7%. France is at a little less than one. Italy is at 2.2%, which is crazy. Um, and Switzerland just went positive. Uh, you can see they're five and, and, and two years negative. Uh, oh no, they're, t they're 10 years still negative. They're 30 years. They're 30 years, you, you would make 0.1% over 30 years. So it's really a terrific, a, a terrible environment for treasuries across the, across the globe. The US is actually higher than most of the, uh, most of the world. Um, so where are we, what are we doing? This is what your portfolio looks like, like most of you. Some of you, your risk tolerance may be a little bit less, so you own the same stocks, but you may own it at less percentage. But my portfolio looks just like yours. And that the great majority, we have about 53% of our uh, portfolio right now in US stocks. 26% is in international stocks, like your Nestle's and, and, and Unilever's and uh, companies like that. And of course, the 53% here is invested in your, your companies like uh, McDonald's. And then we have 19% in bonds. Again, year to date, the stock market's getting killed. NASDAQ's down 11%. S&P's down about nine or whatever today. Um, our bond portfolio is down about 1%. Our US stocks are um, up a fraction, about half a percent. We actually were up today. Um, you'll kind of notice that uh, uh, for those of you who look daily. And our international portfolio was up today too, even though international stocks were down, we were up. Um, so we're up a little bit more than 2%. So overall, we're up about half a percent on the year. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know what the market's going to do day to day. You can even look at that and see um, today that we were up, our balance portfolio was up 0.18% with the market down horrifically. And what that looks like from an allocation standpoint is we have a lot of money in consumer non-cyclicals. These are staples. These are your Procter & Gamble's, Cokes and Pepsi's. We got a big chunk of money in financials, which should do well in a rising interest rate environment like JP Morgan and, um, and, and some regional banks like PNC um, uh, or BNP Paribas, you know, uh, internationally, a, a French bank. We have a big chunk of money in, in healthcare companies, which I think is a very big fat pitch opportunity because healthcare companies did not do, they did okay last year, but not near as well as the broader market. Um, and then we have another in your consumer, not your consumer cyclicals, which are, um, more because I think the American consumer is going to do well and still spend money. And I think from an inflation standpoint, these sectors should protect us a little bit better um, than uh, other sectors like, like the tech sector. So that's what we're doing from, a, um, from the standpoint of our, of our portfolio and how we're trying to hedge against inflation. But we always look for opportunities globally. So even an American company like Procter & Gamble is selling Tide in China uh, or Pepsi is selling you know, Frito-Lay and, and Pepsi products in India. And that, that's where a lot of the opportunities are coming from. And that, that's a big part of, a, a big component of where, where we look for opportunities. It's not just here in the U.S. Of course, we're always looking for income from you. We're getting just a little bit less than 4% in dividends and interest from our portfolio, um, which is going to be there for you even if we were down this year. If we were down 10%, as long as Coke is paying you, you're fine. And if you're like me, you don't need the money, you're taking that 4% and reinvesting it in, in, in the shares of the stock while it's going down, it allows me to buy while the market's down. So Becky's in there doing daily trading and Zach's in there buying new bonds with that cash unless you need it. If you need it to fund your retirement, then obviously you're taking the cash flow out. Um, and we're always looking for dividends, but even though we're, we're not going to reach for yield, we, we still own any utility companies, which thankfully, as you can see, we have it. This is a slide I always show institutions or financial advisors that we sell to. And I'll say, listen, we, we, we like yield, we like dividends, but, you know, thankfully we haven't owned MLPs, energy companies, because they've done horrifically over these last seven, eight years. 
We haven't owned business development corporations. We haven't owned much real estate. We've owned Well Tower, which has been a great stock for us, but that's a healthcare REIT and it's paying us a really nice, you know, uh, nice dividend. And we still have to go in to get surgeries done. So we, we felt that was a good opportunity, but that, that's a rare position for us. So we've well outperformed the broader uh, value index. And even though we do own Staples, um, you know, we've outperformed Staples too, because we tend to not buy unless Staples are cheap. And now, of course, you've seen us over the last year starting to sell some of our Staples companies. So again, our income is there for you. You know, it is down a little bit um, from this 4.27 because we've had such crazy price appreciation. But the absolute income is still going to be there for you regardless. And we kind of, uh, uh, Greg, one of our financial advisors said, hey, we should show how we did during COVID because that's the most recent case where our portfolio values got hammered, as you could see. Um, they really went down, you know, significantly. And you remember this. And we had a quick recovery, but our client's income really didn't get impacted very much at all, only in the sense that we were moving out of bonds, which are yielding, were yielding about 6%. And moving into stocks yielding about four so our total return was higher but your income was there for you and it'll be there for you even if the stock you know value i make less when your portfolio values go down so i don't like to see down values you like to see higher values because it makes you feel better you know and you kind of lock in like oh my portfolio just hit a million i'm really happy with that a million i don't want to see it go down to 950. i always say so what it's still paying you forty thousand a year don't worry about the ups and downs of your portfolio worry more about the income that's funding your retirement. Don't worry so much about the ups and downs um, of the market. So um, come down here and kind of finish this thing off and I'll open it up to questions because I wanted to keep it to about 40 minutes. Um, our dividends are going to be there for you. Our dividends pay a great deal more internationally, a great deal more than, you know, the S&P 500 is paying very little. We're paying almost triple what the S&P 500 pays, which is another reason why we just put the money in an index. Um, so at that, I'm going to open it up and mute everybody here and you could throw out any questions. You could send them into the chat room here or Couldn't have solved all the world's problems tonight. So, are there any uh, any questions out there? Hey, Jim. This is Fred. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Oh, great. Uh, it's cold here at Midland, Michigan, too. Uh, question: uh, You mentioned some of the sectors you like. Got a couple of specific uh, names? Yeah. I mean, so obviously, if you have. Um, if you have your um, portfolio, you know the nice thing about us is we you can look at um, you can look at your portfolio at any time. So I'll show you um, our our portfolio, our 401k at Altria, all of our associates, including all of 100% of my retirement money, uh, is oh. invested is invested side by side uh, you, our clients. And so I'll show you all the names that that we own um, in each sector. So. As I'm bringing this thing over here, let me turn my uh, make it a little bit bigger. You'll notice that we own, you know, we we own a, a good chunk of assets. We don't take big risk in any one stock. You'll notice that once a position is going higher, we're usually trimming it back. You know, like a Haynes brand was a great performer last year. It's up to one and a half percent. We usually trim it down to one. When a particular stock is going down, maybe it loses 20 percent of its value, and it's at 0.8 percent. We're usually buying more shares and bringing it up to one. So we equally weigh our stocks. I don't, I don't love. Sometimes my my son's friends will ask, "What's your favorite stock right now?" And I always go, "I, you know, that's asking me what was my favorite child." You know, it's hard to it'd be hard to uh, to answer that question. I I love them all equally. Sometimes I like some others more than others at certain times, but um, and that's what how it is with stocks too. So I I, I can't say like, okay, this is our favorite. Obviously, um, Qualcomm was one of my favorites, and we just I just sold it yesterday, um, and and you know you thank it you thank you thank it for its service, and uh, at this point I think the upside potential isn't as good. So we just bought Viacom, which you can see here, which yields three percent, and um, you know it's I think it's it's only selling at six seven times earnings. It's exceptionally cheap. Now there's a lot of competition. You got Netflix, you got HBO, you got 
Disney and Hulu and um, Amazon Prime. And, you, you know, and, and if you're like us, you've probably got you know, three or four of these services that are out there. And um, there's probably room for a lot of them. And at six times earnings, I always ask myself, is this the type of company that I would uh, I want to own? Would I want to be the, like, I love owning my company and I love getting up every morning and working in it. And would I want to be, you know, the owner of a Walgreens Boots? And the answer is, yeah, I, I would I would like being the CEO of Walgreens Boots. It's a great, it's a great international uh, company. And, and uh, you know, they're, they're paying you and I an almost 4% dividend yield. They're selling at a reasonable valuation. Um, we bought it during COVID. And uh, you can see it hasn't quite grown very much since we've uh, bought it. We paid $43.72 for it. And, um, you know, some stocks we get paid very quickly, like Well Tower. We bought during COVID, too. It went from 46 up to 83. And at this point, the dividend yield is much lower. It's the only real estate uh, company that we own. Um, I think I love a lot of international um, Excuse me, Mr. Houseman. You know, I, I think I love the I love the healthcare companies like J and J we own, or Pfizer was great for us last year. Um, but international healthcare is really quite attractive right now. Whether you're Glaxo or AstraZeneca or Novartis, um, you know, I think or or even Bayer. Um, you know, I think that these companies, which is still down since we since we bought it um, because of the Monsanto uh, issue where, where they had a, a lot of legal issues, um, and, and I think that. Um, you know, international companies right now are just cheaper across the board. And I think that just like this year where international is outperforming the U.S., if I was for if you forced me to say what's going to do better, you know, over the next five years, I'd say probably international uh, will do a little bit better. And so you could see at least the names if you drill down into, um, you know, if I if I showed you here and I kind of uh, you know, drilled into our, our, our cyclical companies or, or, or names that we own, um, you, you, you know, you see that we own uh, uh, all, all the names that I'm showing you, like our, our energy companies like a, uh, uh, Exxon or, or, or international energy companies like uh, uh, a British Petroleum, you know, BP. Um, I think that to me, Exxon looks great, but British Petroleum looks really cheap with a 4% dividend yield. And and that'll give us some inflation protection also. Um, if we have higher energy prices, that's going to help energy companies also. So um, I don't know if I answered your question, Fred, or not. But. No, that was great, Jim. Thank you. Hey, Jim. That's you. Chris Hi. Kresge here from North Carolina. Hey, Chris. What are the chances of our dividends keeping pace with or even outpacing inflation? Mm. I always love your questions, Chris. Being a former banker, you always ask good intuitive questions. And um, I don't think that they will keep pace with inflation if inflation stays sticky at six to 7%. Because you know, if we're getting a three and a half, four percent 4% dividend yield, then we're not going to keep pace with inflation. That said, I think inflation is probably going to come down from six to seven back down to hopefully three or four by the end of this year. Um, you know, the inflation numbers, if you look at what just came out uh, yesterday, um, I'll show you the, uh, some of the economic data that always comes across the board here. You'll notice that um, the PCE is at six and a half percent, right? This is very, very hot inflation and our dividends are not going to keep up with six and a half percent obviously cash and bonds won't but even our our stocks won't so if i looked at a longer term chart um you have to go back you see this like 1970 and a lot of you remember this in the 1980s we had huge inflation right so the pce indicator was very very high um we're not there i don't think we're going to have the hyperinflation i don't think that's going to be an issue but we could have the stickier higher um inflation that we have right here at the six and a half percent but eventually this year it should get back down to a three percent so you the dividends in of our stocks should start to catch up with inflation here toward the end of this year that would be my best guess you know as a i always liken us economists to uh weathermen you know we kind of we, we kind of we're, we're, we're kind of wrong all the time and and, and we're, we're always talking like a you're taking like a guesstimate um, as a former pilot, I always used to make fun of the weathermen because they'd say, oh, it's clear from here to Atlanta. It's a horrific storm. And 
Um, and that's how it is with economics too. It's a human science, so it's not like physics where if I, you know, if I take my pen and throw it across the room, I know what it's going to do. Whereas a human science, how you and I are going to act can change in a moment's notice. And, um, and, and so I'm not, I'm always, I'm never really uh, a positive, but that would be my best guess uh, that I think we'll be okay by the end of this year. Thank, thank you, Jim. But do you think I need to go back to work? <laughs> no, no, you don't. You don't need to go back to work. That's the one thing that uh, the one thing that's nice is none of our clients, and you can see this. We've gone through hell and back over the last 25 years, and going through the tech bubble and going through the financial crisis, where you know the market was down 20, 25 percent, going through COVID. But these green triangles have always been there for our clients, and. You know, the only time our clients have to go back to work is if you're in a situation where you're like my mom. If you like spending 10 to 15 percent of your portfolio, um, you're well outstripping the returns that you're going to get, and eventually you're going to go broke. And you know, and that's uh, uh, that's a bad thing. But the great majority of our clients, they only take out about four to five percent a year, and um, and that keeps a good stead so that they never have to go back to work. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jim. Thanks. We appreciate everything you do for us. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Send the cat. Send the captain back to work. You don't have to go back to work, Chris. <laughs> no, there's a deal. Right. Thank you. An alternate opinion. <laughs> hey, Jim. Yes, ma'am. Jim, are you there? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Do you know who this is? 